I'm going to be talking about some paleoseismic work. A lot of colleagues are here today and on Zoom um, that we've been doing. Really, I should call them active fault studies uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I like to call it Central Cascadia, where there's a big data gap. Um, but before I dive into that, let's go ahead and open my other PowerPoint. And, and as John alluded to, um, you know, I think it's really important that we stop and reflect on the, the losses that are being experienced in Turkey and Syria. Um, so if you aren't aware, as an educator, there's these teachable moments. I used to put these slides together in a hurry before lectures myself when uh, a large earthquake occurred. But IRIS, the new Earth, Earthscope Consortium, um, provides uh, PowerPoints of slides for teachable moments after a large or even moderate earthquake. So I encourage you, if you're interested in these things, to get on there because you don't have to make them yourselves anymore. Um, we're aware on Monday morning, we learned about this magnitude 7.8 earthquake in Turkey. Uh, it occurred in the early morning hours and this star is showing the location of that. Um, there's been a lot of damage in the last report I heard is that there is 11,000 losses of life. And so if we could just take a moment and this touches me, so a moment of silence to acknowledge that. Um, okay, thank you. So I'm an earthquake geologist, but the societal side, when you move into an area that's been impacted by an earthquake, it is, it's, it's really traumatic to talk to the people and the losses they've experienced or the, the terror that they've experienced as well. And so I really feel for those who are, are going through this right now. Um, so, you know, those of us who are looking at the USGS report says this happened, uh, we saw, you know, here in the US, you'll see really nice, did you feel it maps um, and elsewhere. So that's a, a good thing to do. But this is a modified Mercalli intensity map that shows um, the shaking from extreme to not felt. Um, so that's the color scale that we're looking at here. And we can see that we see, you know, extreme to violent shaking in this kind of Northeast Southwest trend. Uh, the moment tensor for the earthquake is here. And everyone, let's get a shout out to beach ball diagrams. What? Uh, <laughs> to all my students. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks for being here. So this is a, a focal mechanism. And what it is, is it's something that's telling us about the first waves that are arriving at seismic stations in different places around the globe. And if you're really interested in this, take my class in the fall and you can make your own. Uh, with real data. Um, and so what we see are the dark spot, our places on this diagram are compressive and the light are places that experienced um, tension. And this is kind of explaining what's going on for a right lateral strike slip fault. You know, you have an area that's experiencing compression where materials moving into that area. You can imagine, you can kind of do that with your hands and imagine that. Um, and experiences where materials being pulled away, right? And that's shown here by the white. And so this is a, um, a focal sphere here. And so we're taking that sphere and talking, kind of breaking that motion into quadrants and we put it into 2D and that's what we're showing here. So more details in class, I don't have time today. Um, but the, so this is a solution for that magnitude 7.8 earthquake. And so what you can see is that there's two fault planes that are solutions. Um, one would be this Northeast Southwest striking plane and the other would be this Northwest Southeast striking plane. And if we go back to that, and this is where it's great as geologists when it's says not reviewed by human, we don't know which one is the correct solution. We just go back to these maps or to the did you feel it maps and we can get a good feel for the correct solution, right? We see that we have something that's striking relatively uh, Northeast, Southwest. Um, and so here's our fault plane solution for that earthquake. Okay, I can never not teach. Um, and so here we are, this is an area, um, this is a, a solution for the East Anatolian fault. In the hours after the earthquake, the solution, both faults worked. It could have been either an East Anatolian fault rupture or a Dead Sea fault rupture. So both of those focal solutions, uh, fault planes worked for, for both of these faults. It's a very active region. Um, and what we now know is that it was on the East Anatolian fault. And within nine hours, we were certain of that because of the large magnitude aftershocks. Um, Okay, so I want you to imagine having a P in your fingers, okay, and you're going to push down on that P and you're extruding that P out. Which direction does it go? Out that way, right? And so that's what's happening here. I want you to imagine that your fingers are here and you're pressing down. And so we're getting fault motion here that's accommodating the escape of this region and those tectonics. So that's what's driving motion on the East Anatolian Fault in a nutshell. 
Um, we had a magnitude 7.5 earthquake again about nine hours later, very large earthquake, 60 kilometers to the north. Rupture plane is about 190 kilometers of rupture. So this was a pretty big, for the 7.8, pretty big earthquake, very large aftershock, which we do expect to see in the days after a large earthquake. Um, I'm not going to spend too much more time on this. If you're interested, I can share these slides with you or you can find them on um, on the EarthScope webpage, just Earth, EarthScope um, Teachable Moments, Google that, and Turkey Earthquake, and you can get all of that. But again, the drivers in this area there, again, is the Turkish plate that's being extruded between the collision of the Arabian plate and the Eurasian plate. And here we are with the East Anatolian Fault. Okay, um, yeah, I could do more, but let's talk about the Pacific Northwest. I hope that um, for, for those who weren't aware of that region, that, that has provided some information. Okay, so I am someone who works in on crustal faults primarily, um, though I have uh, been digging a little bit into Cascadia and the Neetarts area. For those of you who have seen one of my past students, Jazzy's work. Um, I'm going to talk today about a currently funded grant that I have. And if you're an undergraduate here, uh, I'm looking for students to apply to work with me this summer. I'm going to take two undergraduates to work with me for about a month this summer. It's a paid position. Um, and we'll be doing both remote mapping and some field work, so it should be a lot of fun. So uh, shoot me an email, but I'll be sending a solicitation out shortly. Okay, so um, never intimidating to talk about this when other experts in the area are in the room. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So a review of the tectonic setting. Um, here we are in the Pacific Northwest. We have the obliquely subducting Juan de Fuca plate, um, subducting beneath the North American plate in this region. And nobody knows, but the author is of this article. This image is sitting right there. So hi, Ray. Um, <laughs> So here in the Pacific Northwest, you know, there's some um, really cool papers, both geodetics and looking at um, uh, regional faulting, and I'll show you some pictures of that, as well as um, larger scale kind of bedrock mapping and mapping out um, rotations that have identified this broad scale clockwise rotation within the Pacific Northwest. Um, I like this image because it shows, you know, just a few years worth of um, geodetic data, and you can see this pretty nice signal relative to a stable North America for that clockwise rotation, and of course, a very strong signal along the subduction zone from collision between uh, Juan de Fuca and North America. Um, long-term paleomagnetics, so that's informed a lot of the work in one of these early models um, that Ray Wells and others have put together. Here we have this translating Sierra Nevada block, and so this is kind of a block model to describe kind of the broader scale deformation we see at the surface. But we have this uh, um, the Sierra Nevada block being driven by Pacific North America motion, um, colliding or with um, the Klamath Range to the south, and causing kind of this bookshelf rotation of the Oregon coast range shown here by this pink block. So that's what we're calling the Oregon coast block. As we move to the north, we see that that motion is causing um, transpression in the form of the Seattle faults. And in the Yakima Fold and Thrust Belt, also again, beautiful expression of compression in that region. So these are kind of the, the different structures that we're seeing that are accommodating that broad scale uh, clockwise rotation. And of course, here in Eastern Oregon, we see um, extension uh, in, in this whole region, essentially south of the Brothers Fault Zone. Okay, so today I'm just going to be talking about work that I've been doing, really trying to understand the block models, to understand how we can kind of do science to improve this, to better kind of describe how strain is being accommodated or um, within the crust on these different structures or in these different regions. And what you'll notice as we start looking at the USGS Quaternary Fault and Fold database is that there's kind of a lack of data on active fault structures, despite this beautiful signal that we see in the geodesy, so that short-term data, um, and really nice uh, block models that have been developed to describe you know, paleomagnetics or rotations that have been observed in older um, geologic formations as well. And so in the short term, you know, I'm talking about the time scales of the last 10,000 years to several hundred thousand years, it, it'd be nice to identify faults that can help us kind of piece this um, or refine this model on a shorter time scale. So this is a study by Broker and others. And in gray, what you see are faults from the USGS Quaternary Fault and Fold database. 
Okay, and so this study uses these faults um, to solve for a pole of rotation. Okay, and so that geologic pole agrees really nicely with polar rotation that we um, <laughs> see from both geodesy and from the paleomagnetic and geology studies that have been done. So uh, that's up, up in this region. And let's see, so what did I want to say here? So what we'll notice in this area is that strike slip faults, so something like the faults out in this region, which I'll be talking about, um, lie along small circles. Um, and normal faults are radial to the pole of rotation. And so we'll see that with normal faults that are, you know, out, especially in this area. Okay, and so I'm going to be talking about three sites, um, studies on the Gales Creek Fault um, at the crest of the Cascades, uh, in particular around Mount Hood, um, and then out in the Strawberry Mountains area. And that's work being done by Andrew, who's sitting here. Um, okay, and so here's the kind of color-coded Quaternary Fault and Fold database, and I'm showing this now. Um, all faults in that database are shown in black. Um, I'm sorry, I do assume everyone knows where we are. This is Portland here um, and the Pacific Ocean. I, when I give this in New Zealand, I'll have to slow down and do more of an intro, but for you guys, I'm kind of fast-forwarding, sorry. Uh, there's the Pacific uh, Pacific Ocean here, and here we are in Portland, and there's our Columbia River and state boundary. Um, so black lines are just everything from the Quaternary Fault and Fold database. And the only thing I've colored uh, are the Holocene. So anything that's ruptured roughly the last uh, 11 to 12,000 years are shown in orange from that database. And I've done that um, really because I wanted to highlight, you know, once we move south of Seattle, um, we have kind of a real lack of active faults in that quaternary fault and fold database. Um, and what we've been finding with LIDAR data is that it's not for lack of active faults, it's maybe for lack of the ability to have identified them or studies being done on them. Um, in the Coast Range, I have spent a lot of time trying to find more and it's, it's hard. Um, but we have improved some work, um, um, myself and folks at the US Bureau of Reclamation and Ray, there's lots of people working on these problems now that we have really great surface topography data from um, LIDAR. What I have here in red are fault traces that Ian was supplying, he was feeding all of us uh, it, fault enthusiasts as he was working on LIDAR data in his former career uh, at Dogami. And he is now preparing to teach a class here at PSU. So, so Welcome on board, Ian. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so red lines, what you'll notice are all new faults or faults that you know, correspond with what were mapped as older, not active faults that have surface expression and youthful scarps and are probably active in the last 12,000 years, um, just based on their surface expression in LIDAR data. There's a wealth of faults to be studied. Uh, so the more students we can get working on this, the better. And the same, more faculty, we have a great number of uh, um, researchers at USGS and here who are myself working on it, but um, yeah, more people the merrier. So I'm going to be talking, starting to fill that gap in this kind of oblique transit across our state, talking about kind of, you know, I've been thinking about the broader Portland metropolitan area, but today I'm just going to focus in on the Gales Creek Fault. We'll talk about some work going on in Mount Hood. Um, I'm, I'm really just going to center in on one of those structures of what we're calling the Mount Hood Fault Zone. And then I'm going to zoom out here really quickly and primarily just uh, pump Andrew up because hopefully he'll be defending relatively soon. Um, so I'm going to try not to um, steal his thunder on his defense. So Gales Creek, Cascades, Faults, and Strawberry Mountains. So this is a, a recent publication. Um, this is my former graduate student, Allison Horst, who's um, now a consultant here in the Portland metro area. Um, and she has a publication on this that was published in 2021, if you're interested. Okay, so Gales Creek Fault is here, and it's one of these kind of northwest, southeast striking, strike slip faults. It's a pretty messy structure, and all of the detailed mapping on this and in the broader Portland region has been done by, by Ray. Um, and he's been kind of digging around out in this area for quite a while. Um, and what you'll notice is that there's a fault trace that runs right through what is Scoggins Dam. And because of that, um, it got the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation interested. Um, I spent part of my postdoc looking for faults in the coast range, and this is where that's a whole other talk, actually. Um, and 
yeah, it's super cool. And I'd love to stop and think about that right now, but I have this other talk to give. Sorry, <laughs> I haven't been talking to people. Can you tell? <laughs> Sabbatical is wonderful. I'll continue. Um, so excited to talk science. I could distract myself. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so here I am, we're talking about the Scoggins Dam and the Gales Creek Fault. The fault runs through the current dam. U.S. Bureau of Reclamation um, went out and did a really detailed multi-year study um, that's really kicked off with some LIDAR mapping. Um, and this is one of many trenches, two years worth of different trenches they did along the fault. They started down on the southern part um, and Ray collaborated with them. And here's Ray sitting there talking to Allison, my former student. And I'm pretty sure this is, um, I think that's Joanna. Nope, there she is with the red hat down there, Joanna Redwine, who, who ran the, these studies for uh, the Bureau of Rec. Um, so I went out and I reviewed one of their trenches, one of their first uh, trenches that they had excavated out here, and I got super excited. And um, I said, okay, well, if they're working down here, you know, I'm really interested in, like I talked about with the Turkey earthquake, you know, when we talk about magnitude, it's a function of length, right? It's a release of energy. And so the question is, how big of an earthquake can this fault generate? You know, and so what we're seeing here is a pretty messy series of fault traces. And the question is, can this southern thing where they've definitely identified um, a Holocene active strand, does that hook up and could it rupture with sites here on the north? And if we have a longer rupture, what does it do to magnitude earthquake geology students? Oh, come on, Red, I'm looking at you. <laughs> it, it increases it, it drives it up. They hate it when I call them out. I'm sorry, I'll try to stop. It probably won't happen. Right, it drives up the magnitude. Okay, so, so I was pretty interested in, let's move up here and let's get into some things that are further from what they're doing. The Bureau of Rec did in their second year, they did end up opening some other trenches further to the north. They had loads of work that they've been doing um, out there. So we did, we moved on up to what we call the Clear Creek site. We got onto some property that the Bureau of Reclamation, um, we identified it, went out there, checked it out. Um, I can't remember if we had Ray out there with us before we opened or not, I think we may have. And, um, got permission to get into an area that they couldn't get onto. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the trench results for that. But before I dig into that, um, let's see, it's about 73. If we take all segments of that sections of the fault together, it's about 73 kilometers long. Um, earlier work by Ray identifies 10 to 15 kilometers of dextral offset in Eocene Celestia basement. Um, and along it, Ray mapped out these deflected drainages that you'll notice this is if a right lateral fault, so I should have some motion arrow. Oh, here's a motion arrow there. And you'll notice that these drainages like Gales Creek are deflected from A to A prime there and B to B prime. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. So we can see that this fault's been working on this landscape for a while, but the signal may was maybe lost <clears throat> to the noise, right? Steep topography, lots of landslides, heavy rainfall, um, dense for forest vegetation. Okay, and so Ray's been piecing this together for a while, and I think the lid got blown off the problem when LIDAR became available for this, unless I'm, I'm mistaken. And so with that, you know, we started to see some beautiful expression of the fault. So some of Ray's work, this is in his 2020 paper. Um, this is just really briefly, I, Ray, are you going to talk more about the, the Gales Creek Fault in your talk later this I will be. No, Rick, Rick oh, Rick will be. Oh, yeah, good. That's, that's yeah, no, Rick, it's great. That's You're both here. Yeah. Oh, this is Rick's data. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, well, there's another. So uh, this 2020 um, figure, they show the Celestia, the white outline kind of shows the offset, tracing the outline of the Celestia basement. And you have the um, Gales Creek Fault, which projects through here. And so you can kind of in your mind back this out, right laterally, bring this back down and line it back up with this section there. So I want you to take that, that big purple bump and that red stripe and just slide that back. And that's where you get that 15 kilometers of offset. So that's pretty significant for this structure. Um, kind of go through some other things where I was playing with slip rates, but I don't have time to get to that today. Um, a key thing though, you know, with the slip rate that's estimated in that paper, this is their average rate of 0.62 millimeters a year for these drainages to understand kind of how much this fault has been working in the landscape. 
something like the Gales Creek deflection that's about 750 meters, that'd take about 1.2 million years to create that deflection, okay? Um, we get down here to Parsons Creek, so there's this deflection if we're matching that up, and that's about 2.4 million years. So this fault's been doing its thing for a while to get the, these types of deflections on these creeks. So in my current grant, student, I'm looking for a student to work with me on this. I wanna improve offset measurements. There's some ways we can do this with some MATLAB um, scripts and some LiDAR data. Um, to kind of give us a range of measurements and uncertainties. Great to get someone to work with me on that and to do some new age dating, hopefully with some of my colleagues. Um, so that's an upcoming project, let's see. Okay, moving into the paleo seismology. This is, I need to pay attention to the time. Um, this is the geologic map. Now this is Wells and others 2018. And so here we're showing, we're zooming in now onto that Clear Creek site that I talked about. So here we are on that Northern section of the fault, um, zooming now into that black box there. Um, and here we are, that's this whole box that we've been looking at and Clear Creek site is here. So zooming in there, we see that we have some units including the Yamhill formation um, of the coast range, the intrusive rocks of the coast range here, um, landslides of course, and the fault trace is shown here in black. Okay, and so our paleoseismic site is in that area. And so I'm just gonna first ask you to look at this contour map. And so this is, I like contours because they force you to see things when they're subtle kind of um, things to look at in, in a, a hill shade or slope shade. But what you might notice is, you know, there's a drainage here. We have some steep topography, there's a road. You know, as we go down slope, we see that, that contours get a little further apart as we approach that creek. Um, one thing that I hope would stand out is that you're starting to see maybe that there's this weird bump and this kind of, strange lineation that traverses across the landscape. Um, and so that is the Trace of the Gales Creek Fault. So that's pretty nice for this type of really rugged topography to be able to hone in and, and to see that. Um, okay, and so our moving over to our other figures, we're in here in the intrusive rocks of the coast range, dominantly at our site. Um, we identified two fault traces at the site and just by hiking along and, and mapping um, and with our trench. Um, and so I'm going to show you, this is a, roughly the footprint of our trench. Um, and this is looking uh, to the northwest now. So we're standing here, here roughly and looking in that direction. And so you can see this kind of steep topographic break is here, right? And then this weird flat bench in the middle of a pretty steep hill slope. Um, and that's um, from motion on the fault. Okay, and there's my former student, Allison Horst for scale. You had a feel for that. Um, and so here's the topographic profile shown here and then the outline of the Clear Creek Trench. Um, yeah. Okay, and so we excavated during fire season, which meant that we weren't allowed to have a backhoe on site. So this is, um, we keep contemplating you know, getting people to come do pay to do workouts with us. We say that just this summer as well. Um, <laughs> but a lot of hand digging happens in paleo seismology because you want to get down there and you're looking for offset stratigraphy to try to identify kind of event by event as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, here's Allison, here's Lana, and this is Judy, another former student, hand dug. And what you'll notice, I want you to kind of pick out, we have this like string of really large diabase boulders, so the intrusive rocks of the coast range that kind of end here. And we'll be looking at that. Um, I work as well. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> don't just make students do it. Yeah, this is not how I give my talks normally, but it's good to be giving a talk at home, it's great. Um, okay, and it was a great learning opportunity. I really held off on closing my trenches. I hung on as long as I could before the rainy season. Mary, were you out there for this? No. You were a different class? Okay, I couldn't remember who was there, but um, I got my earthquake geology class of fall 2018 out here and they got to take OSL samples and carbon samples and we did some GPR profiles and had a ton of fun out there for a couple of days. Um, and so what we do, we um, create photo mosaics of the trench exposures. And with that, we're looking at the upper, this is about a half meter by one meter grid. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna walk you through kind of our event evidence at this location. Again, this is currently, or was prior to this paper, um, included in our, in the fault and pole database national hazard map as a quaternary active fault, but not Holocene active fault, right? 
Okay, and so I love this photo. I just stood above the trench because I think the contrast is really beautiful where we have our modern, you know, A horizon, B horizon. Um, we get all those boulders kind of going deeper below the surface, beautiful soil that's doing something through here and then some deeper um, silt and of course mud where we were walking. Okay, and so I should, I guess, maybe ask here, um, anything here stand out? Anyone? Is this? The lowest horizon is poorly drained. This guy, yeah. <laughs> oh, this thing. Yeah, right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, and we had water seeping out along that contact too, yeah. Um, what about this? Brown. Yes. A for the day. Who else? What about this thickness versus this thickness? Right, looks like it's pinching out. Okay, so, so there's a lot of like, you dig in and you're thinking, what kind of mess is this? What am I looking at? Oh my gosh, I have to figure this out. Um, but it becomes a lot of fun. So you get to see the polished end result of it, but the process to get there is a lot of fun. So again, encouraging folks, if you're interested, reach out. Um, okay, so these are our interpreted trench logs. Um, what I love about what we do now with these photo mosaics and now with uh, 3D models that we're playing with is that we can preserve our data and folks can zoom in in really high resolution and reinterpret what we've done. So it's, it's pretty fantastic. But these are the interpreted logs in the interest of time. Um, so here's just the photo mosaic with our line work on it showing different units and then the polygons, which are really important to try to understand kind of the volumes and areas of different units as you're figuring out those relationships. So I'm gonna walk us through the earthquakes that we interpret at the site, um, starting with our second earthquake back and that'll make sense in a moment. So what we have is a buried soil that I pointed out in that photo. Um, and Scott was saying it looked really wet and poorly drained at the base of it. Um, so our, our, that buried soil, what's interesting is we all saw from that profile, we had a steep hill slope that's roughly doing that and then kind of goes flat, right? So here's our steep profile in this area. Um, and then it, you know, there's our flat bench where the, the trench was. And we see that that soil is back tilted into that hill slope, which is rad. Right, so that's cool. Um, that's great evidence of surface deformation. It happens and it truncates right at this beautiful fault um, where we get pretty high contrast in the descriptions of the units, the lithologic units here and kind of the infilling units that are filling a hole in that area. Um, so we have this second earthquake back. It, we have a nice flat surface doing something like what it is today, faulting, back tilting, dropping that soil down um, creating accommodation space, right? And intense ground motions that would have loosened diabase rocks, you know, the intrusive of the coast range that came tumbling down those slopes and then rest upon that event horizon. Okay, and you can see kind of the long flat side is aligned along these boulders and it pinches out where that accommodation space ends. So that makes sense. Okay, so this colluvial unit post-dates that earthquake, this predates that earthquake. If I want to get the age of it, I'm going to collect... Um, you know, any kind of age dating samples. In this case, it was organics, charcoal, um, macro fossils, seeds, leaves or needles uh, as well um, from both of those horizons to constrain the timing of the event. Okay, so now to earthquake one. So we, we have this deformation, we have this pluvial wedge is what I'll call it. because you can see it's a wedge-like deposit that tapers out, right? Thicker here, thinner there. Um, and that's faulted. And then we have a fissure that infills in that area and incorporates this deposit um, into the fissure. So we see blocks of that that are rotated and dropped into this fissure. Um, and that's shown here. So you see one of these floating blocks here. And the rest of this you can just imagine was some kind of a fissure fill of just stuff you know, um, falling into the fissure. Okay, so that's our, our second, our first earthquake, our most recent event. And I have one earlier earthquake at the site um, that we exposed in this trench. I think there's actually more events there. So this would be a great place to get permission to do a deeper bench trench um, with a large excavator, but it would probably take some negotiation with the city of Forest Grove. Um, anyway, so I think there's more potential at this site, which is really common for good paleoseismic sites. But what we see here is that unit 40, as we noted in that earlier photo, it's, it's thinner in this area and it thickens in that area. And so what I'm proposing is that unit 40, we also have this um, color change within unit 40, right? It's darker here, it gets lighter in this area. So we have this gradational color change. So what I'm suggesting is for some reason, 
We have some earlier event that also created accommodation space. Um, and we have infilling of that, um, some kind of accommodation space, slow infilling, um, rather than, you know, really coarse kind of debris, um, you know, ground, high ground motion intensity, uh, shaken debris that's fallen and filled the cluedal wedge. So some difference in depositional environment or shaking, maybe earthquake magnitude, maybe termination of the rupture, we don't know. And this is where it becomes interesting. You tie together information from lots of paleoseismic sites and we can start to figure that out. So hopefully we can do that. Um, and we'll see that as more data from the US Bureau becomes available. But evidence of a third event, we can hypothesize all we want on why it's different, but um, it looks like I won't say the strongest evidence, but weak evidence. Um, and what's important is that we get age dates from it, we describe it as well as we can and clearly as we can, and hopefully we can compare those ages with overlapping ages from other sites and start to say something about the likelihood of this third event back. Okay, so again, I mentioned that to constrain the timing of prehistoric earthquakes, we're collecting charcoal samples. We try to sandwich what, we're call, what we call the earthquake horizon. Um, and when we do that, we create um, these kind of age models. So this is, again, something that I cover if you're interested in learning this in more depth, but um, this is earthquake one. So we have unit 10, which overlies that. Um, unit 30, which was the uh, youngest deposit that was faulted by earthquake one. And that gives us a pretty tight age constraint on the most recent earthquake on the Gales Creek Fault. Um, so about, um, you know, 1,200 roughly to 800 years before present. Okay, so um, we get back to the penultimate earthquake and it's not so pretty. And this is where more work could be done if we really wanted to refine the age of it, or we could you know, really conclusively compare the age of this or improve upon it with other paleoseismic sites to the south. Um, so really broad age range. Again, this is the modeled age here on the x-axis and these are my stratigraphic units here on the y. Really broad age range. Um, and it's just a function of the age of the charcoal that we were pulling out of unit 40. So remember unit 40, if we go back to it, is this dark soil that we saw. So it's a deposit that's pretty long lived and must've been stable at the surface long enough to develop a beautiful soil, which tells us that the deposit is probably older than the soil. Um, and so the charcoal that was included in the deposit is, is older than um, the age of the surface at the time it was faulted. That makes sense. We don't have great age constraints there. Um, we go back to the third, uh, the anti-penultimate penultimate earthquake. Um, again, fairly good age constraints. You know, we don't see strong, stable soil development on um, uh, unit 80. And so we have an estimate there of about uh, 8,000, or roughly 9,000 years before present, if I'm rounding. Only three events, this is fairly weak, but that's an average occurrence of about 4,000 years. Uh, again, this is where the strength comes into having a lot of paleoseismic sites on the fault. What we can say is that we have three surface rupturing earthquakes in the Holocene in the last 9,000 years. Um, uh, and given that, and that we do know that we're seeing similarly aged events to the south, you know, a 73 kilometer rupture length rupturing this full fault isn't too far fetched. Um, and that would yield roughly a magnitude 7.2 earthquake if this fault were to rupture you know, from tip to tail. Um, so the question that I've had in this is, are there implications for other Northwest striking faults in the area? And so this is the other faults that are included in the current USGS Kearney Fault and Fold database. And we see things like um, the East Bank Fault, there's the Portland Hills Fault here, um, the Oatfield Fault, and they all have similar strike. What we know is that one of these faults certainly is active in the Holocene and has been active through the Quaternary. Um, and these are, you know, on the time scales that we've been observing earthquakes, fairly short period of time in the lives of a fault that might rupture every 4,000 years, right? Um, but, but I think given the orientation of it, given what we know about the rotations and how these faults are accommodating that rotation in the Oregon coast block, um, it's probably, you know, it's worth taking the time to try to investigate these other structures. And so that's something I'm looking for someone to come work with me on the Portland Hills fault. I want to, I'm recruiting students to do kind of a geomorphic study, looking at nick points um, in drainages along the Portland Hills fault and, you know, trying to do whatever we can with LIDAR data, to figure out activity of, of some of these other structures. Okay, so I'm moving on to the second part of my talk. Um, and I'm gonna to have to start going a lot faster. Um, <clears throat> I'm talking about the Cascade Fault. 
So this is a photo that Ian took on a field trip we led um, in 2021. Uh, it was incredibly, I think early October, mid-October, and we had snow and like just the week before that I had my earthquake class out there. In fact, like three or four days before that. And we were wearing like short sleeve shirts and shorts and like, it was really comfortable. Um, so we were <laughs> surprised by the snow, but we had snowfall. We still made it out um, to this site. And so this is a trench that we opened. I keep wanting to say last summer, but it was the summer before last um, because I spent last summer in uh, hellish Oklahoma um, with others here. Anyway, this was paradise. So this is a photograph of some of our group. We had, I think a total, Anna, you were there. Are you in this photo? No, uh, we had a total of, gosh, we must have had a good like 10 or, or 11 of us. Charlie, you were there and you're not in it either. Um, uh, so anyway, we had a whole bunch of us. Like, this is a day where we had clearly only four students there working with us on that day. But we excavated a trench here on Mount Hood on the Twin Lakes Fault. Um, and I'm gonna go into some detail on that. Let's see. Um, we are, I don't remember what my next slide is, but we're, we're up on this Northern section of the Twin Lakes Fault just before the White River area, okay? So as we're approaching the really steep topography um, and really active landscape of uh, Mount Hood Summit. Um, let's see, what else? So the Twin Lakes Fault is shown here, south of the, the, the summit of Mount Hood, Edifice Mount Hood. Um, and it's roughly kind of north, south-ish striking, um, kind of north, northeast, um, south, southwest striking. Um, it is a west side down uh, normal fault based on what we're seeing at the surface, the scarps that we see at the fault surface. This in the pink is the multiple mountain fault and that is an east dipping fault. So it creates this nice little robin in this area and scarps on this fault are east side down. So it's really pretty. They complement one another forming this small robin in the area. Um, moving to the north is the Blue Ridge Fault with which Ian and Ray have also trenched in 2011, somewhere in there. Um, uh, up on some glacial moraines, actually further up here. And then this is the Gate Creek Fault, which we trenched in summer of 2020 up in this area. Actually, it might be that red dot there. Um, and so there's a ton of work we've been doing. This is the Tilly Jane Fault, which Ian found during a, uh, he said, and I'll quote you, uh, an incredibly boring Zoom meeting. And he identified and mapped the Twin Lakes Fault. Sorry, Ian. Um, and the, I'm going to call this the wrong name. We were calling it uh, the High Graben Fault System. I can't remember the new name for it. Um, but this whole series of faults, Ian identified uh, within a few weeks of a proposal I put in two summers ago. So it was really exciting. As more LIDAR data becomes available, we keep finding at the crest of the Cascades, this active um, volcanic belt, that there's more and more of these beautiful fault scarps with really nice surface expression, suggesting that they're relatively young. Okay, so focusing in on the Twin Lakes, so just one of these. And this is a great figure that is in our... Um, that Ian put together an oblique view looking towards Mount Hood Summits is from south to north. Um, and it's in our GSA field trip guidebook. If you want that, just uh, log into GSA or our library and you can download that. Um, and this is from that. So we're talking about stop one three here where we had that trench open. Okay, so this is a quick profile. So here's highway 35. This is the White River there. Um, and you see this nice dark liniment. And this is a forest service road. Um, and so this is the fault scarp that you're seeing here. Okay, and so the importance of this scarp is that it is west side down, right? And that's opposite the topography of Mount Hood where we see topography getting steeper generally in that direction, okay, towards Mount Hood. Okay, so west side down, east side up. And what's happening is we see these nice drainages and what that's done is it's created a little dam for these drainages and made a really nice location to try to get earthquake timing and to evaluate um, how recently some of these earthquakes have faulted the surface. So we're going to focus in on this one shown in red. And this is a topographic profile at the site where we excavated the trench. And so we're getting vertical separation just at the surface. So this doesn't include whatever we see in the deposits. Because remember, colluvial wedges and things infill the true vertical separation. Um, of about of a mean of 1.35. So a range of 1.73 to 0.9, what one meter of vertical separation across that fault trace. Okay, and so this is some mapping that we've done that I need to actually um, work on some more. But um, again, there's Highway 35, there's White River over here. And here we are, there's really steep topography dropping down to Highway 35. And here we are on this nice high bench 
um, and we have that impacted drainage, uh, that drainage that's being blocked by the fault scarp. So in 2016, when I first moved up here, in 20, yeah, it was 2016, Ian said, come on, let's go hiking. And he got me out there and I hiked. We didn't know to take this Forest Service road. And so we hiked up this um, with our core and took this sediment core and I sent one age date in and we got this age of about 3,500 years before present. And so what, why that's important, this is our ground surface, right? And we have this nice soil developed here, A horizon down to a B horizon of pretty fine grain silts, um, and then a really dark A horizon again. So a buried soil, uh, a buried soil adjacent to the fault scarp, which again suggests that you have downward motion and you got sediment infilling that vertical separation between those two surfaces. Um, okay, so I was really excited. Um, so something I want to remind us of, this is an active volcano, so I can't just talk about the earthquake geology. Sorry, got a hat tip to the volcanologists in the room. Volcanoes are a thing. Um, <laughs> and so we have a couple eruptive periods that are important for this in, in the old maid eruptive period about 1781 and the timberline eruptive period about 1,500 years before present. And the reason that's important to a paleo seismologist um, this is our trench logs from the um, Twin Lakes Fault. So this is the trench we excavated with the backhoe um, across the fault. And it looks like a big garbled mess. But one thing you'll notice right away is that we have coarser deposits here and we get finer and finer grain deposits as we move down in this direction, right? As we move down in topography. Um, so I'm gonna zoom in on these two boxed areas and just show you detailed stratigraphy there in the interest of time. Okay, and so I want you to keep in mind the ages of those volcanic uh, events, okay, but it, that'll come up when I get to the blue units. So at the, the deepest um, unit that we found is what we're calling um, a melt-out, well, um, oh boy, not a melt-out till. Ablation. An ablation. Um, we have this highly compacted um, sediment that would have been something like an alluvial unit that becomes incredibly compacted by the weight of the glacier. Lodgment. The lodgment right. till. Thank you. I'm blanking on it. Lodgment till. So this is the first time. No, it's the second time I've encountered that. So we have a lodgment till. So this is our oldest unit in the trench. It's like digging into a rock. Okay, it's very hard. Um, and we see that down and we did a pothole here. Andrew did actually and got down to it over on this side of the trench. So we're dropping down across the fault. But what you'll notice is that it steps down and is offset across the fault. Um, this is our melt out till number two, unit two shown here and here. And again, you see that that's faulted and steps down and drops down across the fault. And about on that, we have a soil developed. That's what we call unit two A. Um, so there's a strong kind of reddish soil developed onto that um, melt out till. Okay, so pretty exciting. We have a whole series of units that on lap against the fault scarp. Okay, so unit 10 pinches out um, inner fingers here. This is a, also what we're calling unit 10. Um, and I'm gonna dive into kind of the event timing. Oh, I should have just done that. Lodgement till, melt out till, and colluvium. <laughs> I haven't given this talk in a while. Uh, so here we are. Um, so I'm going to walk you through, let's see what I have on the next slide. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we have a lodgement till that's faulted. Um, we have melt out till that's clearly faulted and we have our first colluvial wedge that's formed. And so we interpret this unit 2A again, that's a soil developed on our melt out till. Um, so this is post LGM soil developed on melt out till, melt out till. Um, and we interpret that as our event horizon. Okay. So unit 10 is formed when you have a fresh face exposed of these units that then erode with time and collapse and you know, cause form this tabular deposit that pinches out away from the fault scarp. And that's unit 10 here, this colluvium. We then get um, you know, continued erosion. So this erosive process is not a short-lived thing. It goes on for a while, but we see kind of our biggest pulse here. Um, that continues, and that's why this is still mapped as unit 10, and it interfingers with um, unit 11. Within unit 11, we have um, an ash deposit, okay? And that's what's outlined in blue and it pinches out in this direction. Okay, so it's not preserved on this side of the trench. It would have blanketed everything if it's an ash. Um, and then we get rejuvenation of the fault scarp. So offset now, we see that unit 10 is faulted. 
right? You see that it's truncated by the fault and it's now in contact, well, it may have always been with unit two, but it's in sharp contact along the fault. And then this is mapped as pink or orange because that would have been interpreted as a free face. Um, so we had some sharp contact that would have continued up, collapse of that material forming our colluvial wedge again. So this is a second of our most recent event um, and that tapers down slope. Overlying that is another ash deposit here. Um, and I'll go ahead and since I already showed you, we um, interpret these to be the timberline ash and the old made ash. And so what's really interesting is that we have some type of an earthquake that occurs forming a colluvial wedge. Um, and in some period of time, we have, um, you know, shortly after this surface rupturing earthquake, we have an ash that's laid down by a volcanic event on Mount Hood. We have a second earthquake that occurs, a second ash that's laid down directly on that colluvial wedge. And so the question really becomes, what is it that we're seeing? Are we seeing evidence of um, a, a normal fault that's somehow accommodating part of that story of clockwise rotation where maybe we're seeing the cascades experiencing some extension? Um, or are we seeing faulting that's you know, somehow related? We notice that pattern of faults around Mount Hood. Is it related to volcanic events on Hood? Because these are both post-dated by ashes. Or my favorite, a combination of the two. And so that's what I'm really interested in. And so work that we'll be doing this summer, will be moving to the south of Mount Hood and starting to look at these newly mapped fault scarps um, where we're getting away from the summit we know we have other beautiful scarps just like the one I've described. And so maybe we can kind of pull these two apart, look at surface fault expression down there, look at the timing of events on faults down in that area and try to tease together the relationship between this volcanic um, system and the tectonics that we know are acting on, the rotation that we know is acting on um, the rocks of the upper plate that we live on, right? So really interesting story, uh, hopefully occurs with a work. That's what I'm hoping for, fingers crossed. I can keep doing that. Okay, um, this isn't the best trench log for this, but this is this other side of the trench. And we had this really cool little fault that Andrew spent a lot of time poking at. Um, and, and I like to poke at my students, so um, he did. And he did a great job of identifying things that were offset. So we saw, you know, the melt out till is offset, the soil on the till is offset and figuring out the upward termination of that fault trace. And the other log actually shows, which I haven't finished digitizing, um, shows this ash is continuous across it. And so that's where we, we hang our hat on saying that um, the ash post dates that upward termination of faulting. Okay, so um, that's maybe in the next version of this talk as I have uh, wrapped up my sabbatical and have more time to work on these things. Okay, so summarizing the Twin Lakes Fault, um, we have evidence of two surface rupturing earthquakes since the LGM. Our most recent event occurred sometime before Old Maid um, and after the Timberline eruptive period. And I have uh, 16 pending charcoal dates that will hopefully help us constrain, better constrain the timing of um, these earthquakes. Okay. Um, and that's what I have with the data I have now, which is very ugly. Again, you're gonna notice the age model ages are here. This is not good. So I'll move on. Um, so conclusions, you know, two surface rupturing earthquakes. What do we know, you know, based on the length of this fault, it could generate probably a magnitude six earthquake. Um, each strand of, of the Mount Hood fault zone could on their own generate around a magnitude six to seven earthquake. Um, and the question is, do they link up? Do these faults link up? Can we have a rupture on the Twin Lakes fault that links up to the Tilly Jane fault that Ian just identified or the, gate, the uh, Blue Ridge and Gates Creek fault? Those are all things we don't know because we've only identified all of these faults since LIDAR data has been available and you know, only a handful of people have been working on them. So there's a ton of work to be done. Really interesting questions to ask. Um, hope you're excited. Strawberry Mountains fault, here we go. Okay, so we're out in Eastern Oregon now, pretty far away from the crest of the Cascades. Um, and this is a really cool fault. Again, Ian sent this email, found another, another series of fault scarps, new LIDAR data. Um, and I said, cool, I have a student who would be perfect for this. Um, let's, let's dig in. And Andrew literally dug into it this summer. He chipped away at it the summer before, but he dug into it this summer. Um, that's a joke because so he was collecting rock samples, which I'll show you pictures of. <laughs> and he dug a pit this summer. So anyway, there's this beautiful roughly east-west trending fault that aligns nicely with the, um, 
actually have a map of it. I'm going to save all of this. I'm going to try to save as much of this for Andrew as I can, but this is about six hours east of us in Portland. Um, this is Andrew and his first summer's field crew. Um, and so what I was saying is it's roughly the red are the LIDAR, the beautiful fresh fault scarps and LIDAR, and black are is the John Day fault. Okay, and so you'll see that a lot of these scarps coincide with the John Day fault, but not entirely. And there's, of course, this really weird thing that's roughly um, kind of north south ish striking. Okay, so focusing in on this structure, um, Andrew's done a great job of looking at cumulative displacement of the fault along strike. So, this is distance along strike shown here and this displacement that he's measured. Um, and with that, broken it into at least a couple of events, um, certainly more than two. And this actually extends up quite a bit more. And I'm going to let him show that plot um, here to 14 to 17 um, in his defense. So attend his defense for more details on that. Um, there's a site that I've been interested in for a while. Um, this is off of uh, Strawberry Creek is here. What you'll notice is in the LIDAR, you can see the fault really nicely cutting this young glacial surface and this older glacial moraine. Okay, so we have two generations of glacial moraines that are clearly faulted. Um, and that's been really great for his work in trying to constrain slip rate on the fault, which we know nothing about. Um, he's also, as I mentioned, dug in um, and did a little test pit across the fault in this area that's yielded really great results. Um, okay, so roughly east-west trending scarp down on the north displaces LGM and older um, moraines. So you see from this profile, this is about 2.7 meters of vertical separation. This is a photograph of that same scarp, and you can see why no one was identifying it prior to LIDAR data. I would have walked past it. Um, so that's me and that's Kate. Andrew took this photograph um, up on this side, down on the other. And there's Andrew chipping away at his thesis. Um, he's collecting helium-3 radionuclide uh, samples. Um, and with this work, he actually has some of the first, in fact, the first, um, absolute ages on LGM glaciation in this part of Oregon. So pretty exciting results. I'm not going to steal a thunder beyond that. And I think you've actually refined this even recently. Keep going back and forth. Okay, oh, we'll talk. Uh, so, uh, you know, the average age right now for the uh, QG, what we map as QGY is about 20,000, 19,900 years ago, plus or minus 600 years. That agree, agrees, agrees with the closest glacial chronology, which is up in the Wallowas. Again, 2.7 meters of displacement, and this is quick and dirty. He's going to give you a lot more on this, but that yields a slip rate of 0.13 millimeters a year. Okay, beautiful active fault, again. Um, I'm going to just keep going because I'm out of time, but this is the site that he's working on now where he has this nice drainage that's been impounded. We have this uphill facing scarp shown here. Um, he did a detailed auger transect across the fault. So again, you can see the fault coming in along this hillside right through here and creating this whoop, uphill facing fault scarp. Really beautiful. Um, and anyway, uh, so at the transect, which he took here, scarp height is about 1.6 meters of vertical separation. And that's shown here. You can see that's the top of that scarp and then dropping down and the fault runs along this area. Um, this is his auger transect from that first summer. So he, had, he did detailed um, coring across the fault, identified a beautiful buried soil, this crazy thick white ash, it's phenomenal. So exciting, very glassy. Um, uh, some more um, colluvium, or uh, so, sorry, alluvium, it's pinching out in this direction, and then another coarser grained colluvial deposit in this direction. Really fine grained deposits overall. So he said, man, I want to go back. And he did this last summer. He went back and he dug a trench across this by hand um, over the course of a couple uh, weeks and got some really great data that I am not going to show in this talk. So if that's not tantalizing enough to get you to his defense, I don't know what is a new trench exposure. Um, so again, beautiful fault scarp and the interpretation currently is that you have faulting that creates accommodation space, you know, forming this colluvial wedge and sediment down in this area that's then draped by the Zama ash. Rejuvenation of the fault scarp, basically another event that tilts that Mazama ash um, and creates a new colluvial wedge, okay? So at least two events at this site. Um, and he gets down to something very hard, which we learned is the lodgement till in this area as well. So uh, again, Andrew's defense for more details. 
So what can we say from the Strawberry Mountains faults? We're out in this area where, um, you know, the models that I showed you, the one with the, the Quaternion Fault and Fold database, um, doesn't nicely or clearly explain why we'd have this east-west striking normal fault. So really cool. Evidence for one to two tool Holocene rupturing earthquakes. This is a nice thing that Andrew put together for an earlier talk. This is a se seismic hazard map. Very low seismic hazard because there's no faults here for now. Um, so that'll change. Most recent event is uh, post-states Mazama ash and better ages are coming on that. Slip rate of 0.13 millimeters a year. Really exciting new glacial chronology for the area. So it's relevant to people outside of earthquake geology as well. So putting it all together, um, you know, when we look back at this, I, I like this map because it takes all of the structures, at least that we know, and, and some of the focal mechanisms as well. Um, and it tries to break things into areas of compression and extension. So explaining it by that. But what we see thing is things like the Yakima Fold and Thrust Belt. Well, that's not extensive, extension, right? So it doesn't quite work. And this is where we need more data to improve these types of models. With the data that we have, we're doing what we can, but we always need more, right? Um, and so in, in trying to understand this, I actually really like, I should have gone back to Ray's figure, put that in here. I think you use this fault as one of your boundaries for that transition from Yakima Fold and Thrust Belt to the extension um, that we see happening in the Northern Basin and Range kind of area. So I, I kind of like that based on what we're seeing in this area. Um, so, Taking that away, coast ranges, we see strike slip. We have evidence of Holocene activity on the Gales Creek Fault, and I expect that other similar, similarly oriented faults are equally likely to be Holocene active. Um, at the crest of the Cascades, we see extension. And in Eastern Oregon, we see uh, down on the north, so what looks like extension, but could be a really cool structural problem as well. That fault isn't optimally oriented to slip, so it's likely a reactivated John Day um, bedrock fault that we're seeing accommodating slip in the current stress regime. What does it mean for hazard in Oregon? I think we know uh, earthquakes are real. These are not plate boundary faults. They're upper crustal faults. So their recurrence intervals are things like every 2,000 years or 4,000 years. They're low slip rate faults relative to things like the San Andreas or the subduction zone, but they're the faults beneath our feet. Right. If the Portland Hills Fault were to rupture, it's going to be a much smaller magnitude earthquake than the subduction zone, but it's closer to home. Okay, so it can be pretty destructive for us here in Portland, regardless of how often it ruptures. So what we really want to know as geologists, when we want to describe hazard and we want to minimize hazard from earthquakes, we want to be able to say fairly conclusively what a fault is capable of doing and how frequently. And if we can, we want to forecast where that fault is, and we can only do that with tectonic geomorphology um, and paleoseismic studies, looking at what it's done in the last couple hundred years to, to tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. So that short scale geology, we need to think about deep time, right? Millions of years. That short scale geology is really important for us um, in giving that information to engineers, to our colleagues over, like my colleague, Diane and Anna Rosh over in engineering. So they can do something as civil engineers um, and so that we can incorporate these things in policy as well. So our goal is to um, keep working on these things and improve the Quaternary Fault and Fold database and national seismic hazard maps to better reflect what our faults can do. So thank you.